Hello there, it's Antrice, and welcome to another episode of the Savvy Painter Podcast. The Savvy Painter Podcast is published every week on iTunes, Stitcher Radio, iHeartRadio, and SoundCloud. If you are a painter or artist who is looking for down-to-earth, real-life conversations about art, how to create it, how to sell it, you are in the right place. Savvy Painter has been downloaded over a million times by artists in 150 countries. This is the place where you will find your community, you will be inspired to create, and you'll hear real stories from artists who are thriving with their art. So if you are new to this podcast, I want to welcome you to the Savvy Painter community. But make sure you don't miss an episode. Sign up for weekly updates, free guides, and workshop announcements. Go to SavvyPainter.com and click on Join. It's that easy. Trakel Art Supplies is sponsoring this episode. Trakel offers sensibly priced art supplies conveniently shipped to your door. For over 30 years, Trakel has been obsessed with the art of brush making. They have been testing and tweaking their brushes to get the perfect balance, flow, and snap. And from now until July 20th, when you use promo code SAVVYGIFT, you get a free number six round golden Taclon brush to try out. So head over to trakel.com. That's T-R-E-K-E-L-L.com and use the promo code SAVVYGIFT at checkout. And Trakel's going to toss in that free paintbrush for you along with your order. Julian Marrow Smith is a British painter living in Provence in the south of France. In February 2005, Julian started Postcard from Provence, a daily painting project at ShiftingLight.com. He's completed over 2,600 daily paintings. Postcard from Provence has been featured in the New York Times, the Times, USA Today, The Guardian, and The Sunday Telegraph. Julian has been selected not once but twice for the BP Portrait Award at the National Portrait Gallery in London. He has also shown at the Royal Society of Portrait Painters in London and was selected for the New Contemporaries Exhibition at the Institute of Contemporary Art in London as well. In this episode, Julie and I talk about a whole host of delightful painting topics. We talk about optimism and pessimism in painting, how his personality dictates his painting style, the importance of diligent practice, lifelong learning, and continual improvement, some of my favorite, favorite topics, and of course, how we can be kind to ourselves as artists. Not only that, but Julie and I both realize that we will be in Italy at the same time, so we actually get to meet each other in person. This is so exciting. I can't wait for that. So here we go. I am so happy to introduce you to Julian Merrow Smith. Julian, thank you so much for being on the Savvy Painter podcast. I am delighted to finally get you on the show. It's an absolute pleasure. I would love to hear a little bit about you and your work and how you got started as an artist. For the two people out there who have no idea who you are, please enlighten us. (laughs) (laughs) Oh, come on. I kind of, I I moved to France 18 years ago now and start, so I started, uh, I'd taken redundancy in London and moved out here. A friend invited me and um, I didn't, I only bought a one-way ticket and his wife very quickly found me somewhere to stay. (laughs) How kind (laughs) of her. It wasn't their house. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> and yeah I started painting then really I mean I, I, I started in London a few years before you know I went to art school a long time ago and stuff but I was a conceptual artist I never really painted I eschewed all that kind of artisanal thing and wanted to be a great intellect you know like yeah right so uh, when I came here I started to really learn to paint so you were make sure I understand this correctly you were trained as a conceptual artist well i went to art school in the you know late 70s so they didn't teach you anything there was stuff available and most most of the painting that was going on there was some figurative but it's mostly there was a life model she wandered around in a kimono and nobody ever seemed to use her so okay so that's really interesting so you had you had this conceptual background which you feel like taught you absolutely nothing about art? Well, no, I, I mean, I knew a lot about art, but I mean, it wasn't a lot about technical stuff other than, you know, the things I needed, uh, photography and uh, other things. So I did stuff in England. You have to go through a 
is you do a year's training first where you do everything. Uh, you do 3D design, you do graphics, you do uh, you know, painting and pottery and so on. And then you choose which you're going to do at degree level. So I went off to, so that was the last time I'd painted up till 1999. <laughs> so between 1977 and 1999, I didn't paint at all. What did you do? I did a lot of laying down in fields and taking photographs of myself. I wrote my thesis on Richard Long. And then, you know, I kind of got involved in kind of boring things, you know, buying houses and um, doing boring jobs. <laughs> <laughs> By that, do you mean non-art related jobs? Is that what you're trying to say? Yeah, really. Until I got, until actually I started running a, I used to run cinemas. I was working in a cinema and then I eventually ran cinemas for a small company in London. So I, I eventually took the job to work at cinemas so I could paint and never really did. And then I eventually ended up running the cinema in Chelsea in the King's Road, and I started employing lots of painters. And then I started going to openings again, and uh, Pete Doig was regularly cycling past and popping in to say hello to his friends, and, um, you know, the guy's penny going for $33 million. Oh, that Peter Doig. That Peter Doig. <laughs> So I was kind of hanging around with those guys, and I started going to openings and getting interested again. And I saw a show by an English painter, Ivan Hitchens, at the Serpentine in London, and I just had never seen anything like it. Very kind of kind of abstract landscapes. And I just loved them, and I started painting. And then there was Lucian Freud at the time, was very big, and I, so I started painting myself. And then eventually... I, yeah, I started painting myself a lot, and then I took this redundancy and came down here. And then when I came down here, I was about to be, I think I was 39 when I came down here, and I uh, wanted to get into the BP, which at the time you had to be under 40. And so I had a year, and I put a painting in, spent a, you know, a few months doing this painting and put it in for the BP and got in. And that was my first, like, uh, ooh. <laughs> I had, you know, going to the National Portrait Gallery and go to the opening and so on, and... Uh, and at this time, were you living in, in France then, or yeah, were you still yeah. in England? Okay. Yeah, I've been here for about a year when I did that. Yeah, so I'll let you get the word in any ways. I do apologize. <laughs> I'll just shout over you. You know us Americans. You know how we are. <laughs> when I want Good your life. attention, yeah, I will get it, Julian. <laughs> <laughs> okay, fine. <laughs> So, um, and and for people who are listening, it's because we were, but prior to this conversation, uh, we were making jokes about uh, British communication styles versus communication styles from the US. And we have, yes. we people from the US have this, somehow, I don't know how we got it. We have this, people think we're loud. I don't get it. <laughs> <laughs> this undeserved reputation. I know. It's just, it's offensive. No. But it, it was you that said it, not me. So. <laughs> it was me who said it. I will own it. My, and my husband tells me all the time, like, oh my God, you guys are so loud. So you, you moved to France and then you had to quickly within one year, get into the BP Portrait Awards. Yeah. Kudos to you for for doing that and getting getting in there. But I'm kind of curious. So you were you said you were going to these art openings and seeing these paintings that really sound like they inspired you in London that inspired you. Yeah. Mm. Why the move to France? That was just a redundancy. So I had a bit of money and I'd been painting sort of in my, you know, in my spare room. And I had a friend, actually a friend who I'd gone to this uh, foundation art college with mm -hmm. he'd gone he went off to oxford and did english instead deciding art wasn't for him but we stayed great friends and he's been a great supporter and he was here he'd written a very successful novel and he'd initially left london for the cayman islands and they lasted six months and then came back came to here looking for sunshine and so he invited me down you know like uh, <laughs> rent a friend <laughs> so i came down and i stayed he basically went off to Hollywood and I stayed here. <laughs> As is the way of these things. Isn't it? <laughs> Very strange. So I got I got marooned here. <laughs> well, it doesn't sound like you've been suffering. No. So he was he was great. He was initially he was a great supporter and he bought paintings early on. So that was how I was making my living, just with him buying the odd painting. <laughs> oh, nice. Okay. <laughs> yeah. So I have a lot to thank him for. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah. And and his wife too, it sounds like, for finding you a place to live. <laughs> yes. 
So tell me about what, you know, so you get there and you hadn't been painting for a long time and you become interested in these sort of abstract landscape paintings. It sounds like at that point you pretty much had to teach yourself how to how to paint since you didn't get a lot of instruction in college. Yeah, I, I, I can remember the things that have been spoken about. I can remember my you know, some of the things that have been said to my girlfriend at the time back at the college, but no, I'd never really had any uh, sort of instruction in painting. So I did the usual thing. I got all the books, and it was pre-internet, you know, nineteen ninety-eight. So, yeah, books and um, and trial and error. Looking back at it now, after however many years that is, <laughs> yeah, for twenty years, yeah. What were some of the things that you did that you think were particularly useful in teaching yourself how to paint? Um, I, well, there's, there's no, there's no way around it. You just got to do it. <laughs> you just got to do it again and again and again. You know, I, I, I think it was, it was maybe on um, your podcast the other day. Somebody was saying that one of the things about painting is that through painting, you learn every day. If you're painting a day, I mean, if you, however long it takes you to do a painting, you're kind of learning what you don't want to do. So kind of every, every painting is kind of like, yep, that's not what I wanted. And so you're kind of, you know, it's a, a search for forever, you know, for trying to get somewhere. But I think that, you know, just mileage, you just got to keep, that's the only way around it, you know. Unfortunately, it's, I think it's, I think it's always kind of disappointing. I do say this to my students quite a lot and they go, <laughs> I can't believe you said that, but you're invariably put up against your own limitations. You know, if you paint every day, you'll be put up against your limitations every day. And there are obviously days when it goes well, and there are days when you kind of know what you did yesterday that you want to solve. And, and there are days when you're just tired and it just doesn't go very well. And yeah. Work. That's all you can do. Right. And listen to people. <laughs> <laughs> All of the above. But I think that you're right. The simple thing that few people want to hear is that if the best advice you could possibly get to improve your painting is to get your butt in front of an easel and paint. Yeah, <laughs> and it's, it, it's, it is it. that simple. Yeah. And it's, it's that way. I think, you know, like that, that is something that is the no nonsense answer to everything. Like, how do I get into a gallery? How do I do this? How do I do that? You paint. Yeah. What kind of artist do I want to be? You know, oh my God, just paint. <laughs> how do I find my, how would you answer that question? I get this very often. How do I find my voice? Yeah. My wife has been playing the cello since she was four. And she's, what, 50-something, and I'm not allowed to say probably. So, you know, that's a, that's a long time. That's a lot of a lot of practice, a lot of dedicated, deliberate practice. And if you start at painting at 40, <laughs> there's a slight disadvantage, you know, that's, that's for sure. Do you think so? Yeah, I mean, you know, my wife uh, at 40, she'd already had 36 years of practice. I mean, if I start painting at 40, it's, um, you know, she's 36 years ahead of me. That's a lifetime. That's you know, certainly half a lifetime. That's a long time. It is. I'm always noticing the that there's sort of a caveat to that as as with everything. Like that I would I would agree if it's thirty six years of diligent practice. But oftentimes I think people can do the same thing over and over again without really realizing that they're doing the same thing over sure, and over yeah. again and feel like they're putting their hours in, but they're not getting anywhere and what's wrong with the, this picture. So sometimes I think the maturity can be helpful or the urgency that comes with it. Yes. I mean, it's true that if you, you know, I mean, late starters can go a long way by really practicing in a very, very controlled and deliberate way. But, uh, you know, if you're a professional cellist, you're, you're doing that anyway. There's not really, you know, True. the greatest orchestras in the world. And, you know, it's not like, um, so um, there's no real sitting around, you know, fiddling. <laughs> Ooh, there's a bit of a pun there. Uh, a friend of Ruth's came on, a friend of my wife's came on one of the workshops. And he's a cellist and he's just retired from, you know, he was head cello of a major London orchestra. And, of course, he wants to paint. He's been collecting paintings and... You know, but he's time and age, and he wants to be as good at painting as he was on the channel. Now, you know, mm -hmm. if you start at in your late sixties or whatever, it's it's difficult. 
you know, you are at a disadvantage. You can be very good. I mean, you know, but uh, there's an awful lot of work to do. And nobody goes on a five day or 10 day or weekend workshop to learn how to play the violin. They don't do it. Where would you be? True. Well, they do. I think they, they try, they want that. And then they're, they're just sorely disappointed when all the neighbors are pounding on the wall, begging them to stop. <laughs> I mean, it's very, I mean, those kind of things are very good for honing techniques and seeing how other people do things and so on. But anyway, I, don't, I didn't mean to be depressingly kind of don't even bother if you're older than four, but, uh, you know, obviously there's an advantage if, you know, you see there's some great painters out there and you can see what they did when they were 16, 17, and you know, they did amazing work. Tell me a little bit about your, your process and how you work then. What is it when you're in your studio or you're outside painting? Tell me how you, you start your day. I'm a great putter off of things. So I tend to be, I've got a studio that is faces east. So the light comes in. So it's pretty useless before a kind of midday. I've got a bright sunlight coming in most of the time. So I tend to deal with the stuff I have to deal with uh, of running a small business you know, in the mornings and work in the afternoon. But I'm, I am a terrible procrastinator. I often have to go out and find something to paint or I've got a plan. So I often kind of work on, I tend to work quite seasonally. So I've, I've got, you know, the things that are happening around me. I live in the middle of the countryside here. So at the minute, you know, peaches have just come into season and I'm painting peaches this week mostly and you know i can set up a still life and i can find some interesting light and and work on the things i didn't do so well yesterday and so i'm fairly kind of safe in what i'm doing what is it that inspires you to paint what else would i do no i mean there are many things i i actually think it's a really good habit to get into i clearly it's that when i'm in front of a particular thing setting up, setting up a still life or uh, or out in the countryside then it's light, you know, it's just light. Basically, you sit down, you move the stuff around, and then there'll be a moment when, you know, the light does something wonderful, and all you've got to do is sit down and try and capture it, mm -hmm. <laughs> which is the difficult thing, of course. When you're in those places where you're not particularly inspired or you're getting tired of painting peaches, for example, what do you do? Yeah, you know, change it up, go and paint by the river or something. We've been trying to go most years in the autumn now to Venice, for example. It's just a really nice change after a summer, you know, painting here and just to be around boats and water and so on, for example, is great. Or we go to the seaside or some, you know, place. I mean, one of the lucky, lucky things that I have here is that I'm mean, three and a half hours from the Italian and the Spanish borders you know mm -hmm. so i can be in barcelona or, or you know genoa or whatever in four hours so you're in the you're in the south of france yeah okay yeah. but marseille is about an hour um, so there's always something i can do to get up and shoot around and because it's very easy to travel with painting kits and i've got it down to a you know fine art of a small box and small amount of paint and so on i can you know, I can pretty well take it with me, with me wherever I go. So we, we, we tend to do quite a lot of holidays together, where I, which are designed around me being able to paint. That's, that's, very, that's very handy. Yeah, it is. It's, it's wonderful. Can you describe your paint kit? Yeah, I've got a fair few different paint kits. But um, generally what I've been using is, uh, is Ben Haggett's uh, Prima Poche boxes, which are uh, great just because all the kit just fits inside. So I've got, uh, you know, I keep all my paints and so on. What is, I'm sorry, what is it? He's, um, there's a guy in Montana. He, uh, it's called Ala Prima Pocha, and he makes these wonderful handmade boxes full of magnets and magic. But they hold, you know, four boards and all the paints and so, and fit on a tripod, and they're very neat for traveling. I've got a little, a tiny little one, which is eight by six. And, well, I've got 20 of those. So it's my workshop. Um, you know, they're 10 by 8s. And, uh, and then I have a couple of more things too that I use. And uh, I've just got some newer Italy, which um, so I can paint bigger. And, but it all comes from America, of course. The, all the great, all the good plain air kit comes from America, which is a, a pain for us people that live over here in Europe, but at least it's available. Yeah. Yeah, I would imagine. Like if you, it's, I remember that from when I was in Argentina, that if you have to import something, it's quite the nightmare. Mm -hmm. But I think, you know, if you go to a 
go to England and see people like Ken Howard, they're still using Julian boxes and, and things. And uh, it's quite difficult to get the kit. And But luckily, I have good relationships with people in the States that provide me with the equipment as I'm providing a workshop. So I've got quite a lot of it. So yeah, I'm a big purchaser of kit. Even as far as I now tube my own paints in tiny tubes, and I bought 5,000 paint tubes from China. So I buy big 200 mil things of expensive colors and put them in small tubes. Really? For my workshops, yeah. It's, I'll show you them. Yeah, I'd be curious to see them. <laughs> yeah, I provide all the equipment because just because... Because I'm a control freak, possibly, but it's also just that if you know they're using the same things as you, then, you know, it just makes it so much easier to teach because you're teaching exactly what you do. Not necessarily style-wise, but, uh, you know, that you can show them how these things work. And so most people that come here for my workshops are looking for, you know, obviously something that I do particularly that they see in my work and they, they want to somehow either incorporate that or, you know, in action or whatever and so if i'm providing all that kit it's very good from my point of view and hopefully good from theirs yeah so i'm curious also when you started so you taught yourself how to paint and and you started to have some success with it it sounds like when did you decide that you wanted to start teaching workshops and what was it that sort of got you on that track yeah i I didn't ask quite a lot to teach, and, I, and I, I thought I would be more likely to take workshops and give them, feeling always somewhat kind of inadequate in my abilities and so on, and still do. Actually, I was ganged up by my wife and a friend, and, and uh, they um, said they'd organise it all. And so Ruth and I, actually, we, we kind of come up with these ideas every now and then and uh, put them into action, and that's really happened. And we found a, a place to hold the workshops. And I said, I'd have to have all the equipment. And so it was 2013. And I'd never taught before. And we got a, we sort of invested all, all the equipment for you know, f- up to 14 people. I think we had you know, 15 kits for 12 people, basically. And found somewhere th- that would look after them all. And announced it and sold it. And the first bunch came. And it was um, extraordinary. Yeah, it was uh, it was, you know, something I've heard other people say. It's just, it's very useful to put what you know, to have to put into words and have to kind of format it for people in a workshop. It's a terrific exercise mm-hmm. you know, for the teacher. Yeah. And of course, you know, it's a very unsociable thing, painting and, and running workshops it is very sociable. <laughs> It we is. <laughs> yeah, we we unlike most of the things you'd attend in the states. You know, it's all in one place. Uh, everybody's bed and breakfasted and fed, and you know, evening meals. And uh, we take them on a wine tour for the entire week too, like at the dinner table every evening. So I kind of advertise it as live the life of the Provencal painter, but it's probably a little bit richer than my general, my life generally. <laughs> <laughs> Eating well every night and <laughs> three meals a day and you know drinking fine wines. But it's, it's been um, it's been great. This episode is sponsored by Trakel Art Supplies. Trakel has always made it a point to get to know the artists who use their brushes. So I wanted to talk to a few of those artists. My name is Gray Crayola Simpkins. I'm an artist. I've been working with Trakel for, gosh, it feels like 12 years. I forget the exact amount. Trakel had gone out to see Greg at his studio to learn how he uses his brushes. They were doing a little research and development to kind of improve their line. A lot of the brushes I was using, I would damage them pretty hard because, you know, I work pretty hard with the acrylics and then they wouldn't spring back fast. And I noticed that Trakel brushes, they held up longer and I was like, well, that's really cool. They ended up developing a relationship and pretty soon... They're like, would you like your own? set of brushes. I was like, oh my gosh, that'd be amazing. It's like a skateboarder getting his own skateboard, right? I wanted to hear it straight from Greg, Turkel's first pro team member. And we'll talk about what that means in another episode. But what I wanted to know was what makes Turkel so different from other brands of brushes that he's used? They held their point better. I don't know if it's because when I have gone up there and watched them make the brushes, it's all in house right there. You just see the care that they hand make each one. So you could just see that they put a lot of love into making the brushes and it comes out when you're painting. 
And don't forget from now until July 20th, when you use the promo code SAVVYGIFT at checkout, Trickhell is going to throw in a free paintbrush for you. So you get to try these out on your own. Trickhell is going to throw in a number six golden round Taclon brush for you when you use the promo code SAVVYGIFT at checkout. So head on over to trickhell.com. That's T-R-E-K-E-L-L.com and use promo code SAVVYGIFT. So I'm really curious about this because I know that there's a lot of artists who have questions about how do you get that, how do you start the workshop? And I think one of the things, at least from what I see, that stops people at first from doing it is kind of what you referred to, that feeling of inadequacy, that who am I to teach what I paint. And I think it's really interesting what, what you said, because I think... I just want to kind of highlight something that you said that I think is super important for this, which is that when I hear at least people struggling with the idea of whether or not to start a workshop, their struggle is who am I to teach painting? There's so many other painters out there who do it better than I do, perhaps, or blah, 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 like, you know, something along those lines, this idea that they're sort of competing with other people. And so I really like what you said about your students come to you because they see something in your work that they like and that they would like to achieve. And that makes you the only person who could possibly teach it. So to answer the question, who am I? (laughs) You're the only one that can do it. (laughs) Mm, Yeah, it's interesting. I mean, well, I'm sure that there are other people that could do it, but uh, there's something about clearly, you know, there's something about whatever I offer at my work that they they want, and it's a certain kind of slapdash quality as well. <laughs> <Maybe>. <laughs> no, no, a certain freedom. I don't know. Well, there's a looseness to your work, and that's that's something that I think is very difficult to obtain or to understand because looseness when not done well is just sloppy or you yeah. know or people think that looseness is something that you don't need a lot of skill to do that mm. i know you were joking when you were saying it that slap dash just slap <laughs> it on there but you've taken 20 years to learn how to do that yeah, yeah i guess it's always the thing that allows a certain looseness as long as the drawings are drawing structure the usual things and not that i claim to be any great shakes in those either but um yeah you can i, I remember you know the, the, talking about something like uh Mane, you know how i think it was a uh, who's suffering somebody suffering he was taking like she sat like she said she'd sat a hundred times and she he still hadn't got a likeness <laughs> and i'm sorry you said there. did you say Ma- Mane? Mane, yeah yeah okay Mane, yes. There's a certain kind of looseness that's that's actually it's put on. It's, I don't mean put on like uh, falsely. I mean it's it's deliberate. It's part of the process. It's um, so you, you know, like he'd work with a, a strong structure, but there would be a certain deliberate looseness, unfinishedness, uh, certain kind. Of, it's not something that just happens. The looseness, and it's not a gimmick or a tick either. It's deliberate. It's built in. Yeah. With somebody like Manet, for example. How about for yourself? Yeah, it's something I tried to, well, I, th- I mean, if you, if you were to take it apart, I mean, we're talking about kind of interesting surfaces, interesting brush strokes. Yeah, this is going to make some people kind of like cringe, the idea of energy uh, and so on. And I'm a, you know, I'm a great fan of people that can just paint perfectly still, beautifully composed with light. It doesn't, you know, as long as the light works, it seems to me it, it doesn't matter if it's loose or or time. That's really, that's the thing that makes paintings interesting. Yeah. They've been interesting for hundreds of years before even photography existed, is that people made evocations of light. And uh, that's what touches me in paintings. Yeah. So within that, I have very deliberately loosened uh, and what buttery, God, horrible words. Anyway, deliberately loose strokes. I also quite like the idea that things quite fall apart when you get close to them. It does come down also to it. Partly temperament, too. I, if I take more than a day over a painting, I, the chances of me finishing it are slimmer. So mm-hmm. there's nothing wrong with it, but my temperament doesn't really suit the idea of building up a painting over weeks. 
mm-hmm. laying it all in and doing undercoats and glazing and so on. It just does not suit my temperament. I'm more of a sort of sword fighting, swashbuckling kind of painter, I guess. <laughs> <laughs> oh my that's a God, great that's image. also so terrible. <laughs> it is hilarious. I do paint in tights. That's oh, good. Good. Good to know. <laughs> with a, And do you have like on your back, like one of those... For your brushes, just like they do with the arrows. What are those called? A quiver. A quiver. Be good. Yeah. Yes. One thing you were starting to say was that you really like this idea of, or you like the fact that when you look close at a, at a painting, that it sort of starts to disappear or it breaks up in the style of work mm, yeah. that you do. So I wanted to let you sort of finish that thought. Yeah. One of the things I, I, I actually, I, I really kind of, in my Whilst I am, for want of a better word, self-taught, you know, once the internet kind of got up and going, and now there is such a richness of stuff to study online. And uh, one of the people I referred to quite recently was, uh, or a couple of years ago, was uh, David LaFell and, and Cheryl. David LaFell and Sherry McGraw, yes. And Sherry McGraw, yeah. She's talking about the fact that paintings are designed to be seen across a room. If they work up close, that's great, but that's not how they're designed to be seen. They're mm-hmm. like sort of advertising boards or something. And I love that idea. So I try and uh, I tend to paint at arm's length. You know, I really do fully extended brush and the full length of my arm. And um, that tends to mean that you're further away. If I'm only working eight by six or 10 by eight or whatever, then you're six feet away from the thing. Mm -hmm. And uh, that would be pretty well equivalent to what from the setup. So you'd see things pretty well the same size and and you're forced to kind of paint in a kind of approximate way you know you're you're forced to use larger brush strokes you're mm-hmm. it's not a sort of minuscule up up close kind of a small brush thing so i've taken that on too and given that my short attention span i like to kind of finish things quite so i guess that uh, idea of that's pretty well how I approach things. Mm-hmm. And whilst being outside, you know, clearly the light changes very quickly and you've got to be pretty quick. Otherwise, you're really in trouble. So, yeah, and that kind of sums up my approach. Yeah. <laughs> well, and that fits perfectly with how you paint, obviously, you know, so yeah, you've suited yeah. your painting to your temperament. When I'm painting well, I, I, I'd, I'd say. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I just spent a day in the studio. It's not exactly to how I'd uh, like, but hey, there's always tomorrow. There is. And this idea that we have to do perfect paintings every time we walk into a studio, I think is probably one of the most damaging myths out there for artists. That's, that's why I like this idea that uh, you at least learned what you don't want to do. <laughs> yes, that is very Every good. time, you know, it, it seldom really goes exactly as you want. I know, I, I really do tend to think of painting as kind of, I wouldn't do anything else, but uh, it's kind of disappointing on a daily basis. <laughs> <laughs> a daily painting is like disappointing on a daily basis. There you go, that's it. That's a great quote. <laughs> then if that's the case, if it's every day is a disappointment, <laughs> that's good. That's a great title for your next book, Julian. <laughs> a painting a, a painting a day, a recipe for daily disappointment by Julian Marrow Smith. <laughs> yeah. I mean, I'm not a depressive person. Well, actually, my wife might disagree, but um, but uh, no, I mean it just is that if you can't, if you're not really this the other day to somebody who quoted it uh, the idea of uh, now, which cellist was it I can't remember the cellist but you know 90 years old still practicing every day and he was asked why he practiced every day and he said I think I'm king somewhere that's the kind of that's the yes my wife said that's a misquote and she's but uh, as a cellist but it seemed like a very good idea at the time well it's even even if it's a misquote the idea behind it is that painting and music the arts are about lifelong learning and and that you can't get too full of yourself nor take yourself so seriously that you ever feel like you've gotten some gotten quote there and have nothing left to learn i think that's the point at which you yeah sure, sure. sort of die yeah. as a painter <laughs> How's that for depressive? <laughs> yeah, I can't imagine a situation. That I can't imagine anybody ever thinking they'd got to a point where they were really lay down the brushes. I'm done. <laughs> no, but you do. You do. Gonna, <laughs> you occasionally hit them out of the park. That's, yes, you know that's that's. I think that's the most you can hope for. Yeah, you feel good about that particular painting, and you know, for me. When I feel like, okay, I said what I wanted to say, um, which is sort of the point where that painting is done, 
I don't feel like, oh my God, I'm so awesome. I'm the most awesome painter in the world or anything like that. I just feel like I pick something up that I can now take with me to the next painting. And it's more an excitement to start the next painting and take what I've learned. It's like if you're a little kid and you just learned a new word, yeah, you're like, yeah. oh, goody, I get to learn this new, I get to use this new vocabulary. And now I get to go play with that new word or whatever the visual equivalent of that is that made me feel like, okay, I said what yeah. I wanted to say in that painting. Absolutely. Yeah. The thing that I wanted to ask you about this idea of it, a recipe for daily disappointment, from that perspective, when you do have those like, ah, you see it as now I know what I don't want to do. How do you take that forward? I'm just kind of curious. Because I think it is so important to know what you don't want to do. And I'd love to hear from you, like when you have these days of that was a disappointment, how do you continue to paint when you're sort of in that mode, if that makes sense? It's not like wrist cutting kind of uh, disappointment. What I mean is that it's kind of incremental, you know, it's you're hoping, I, I think the sporting metaphors are good, you know, that you go to the park and you want to score a home run, you want to hit out of the park and all that kind of stuff. And most days, if you went in there and every, every day and did that, then um, wow, you know, then you would be one of the greatest players ever. So it's not like that. So there's always, it's not really, I, I suppose disappointment is a very strong word. I guess there is a sense that you know you can always do better. Mm. And so that every day is, every day in the studio is, is kind of adds to that experience. Let's, let's be kind to ourselves. So I can call it mildly disappointing. I mean, it's kind of like, damn, I really wanted to, hit that out of the park and it's not really it's it's okay you know it's it'll go on the market and sell it and so on and uh, I suppose it's that thing of I know I'm not there yet mm -hmm. and of course you will never get it so that's probably a good thing but it just means it's like back to the drawing board you know and when it's going well and when you've got time in the studio and you get a good run of work many days on the trot where you're really trying to and you're taking problems from one day to the next and you're trying to solve them. And, you know, that's when it's really great. And that doesn't happen all the time. Sometimes it's just a, you do a day here and didn't feel quite like you wanted it to go. And you have big plans at the start of the day. You know, you really want to do a great painting. And it's seldom the case. It's usually some kind of compromise. That's mm -hmm. kind of what I'm, that's what I'm really trying to say. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. That makes sense. And that's always slightly disappointing. Not risk cutting me. Not risk cutting lay. That's good to hear. <laughs> <laughs> It'll be all right tomorrow. <laughs> exactly. It's the, it's the Beckett quote, you know, is it fail again, fail better. That's, that's really you know, all you can do. You just keep on, um, it's just like life really. <laughs> it is. I really think it is. that <laughs> Every day, just try and be a better human being. And <laughs> yeah. If you can get 1% or 2% better than where you were yesterday, yeah. then that's a good day. Not 5% better, yeah. yeah just, a, just a little bit, because every day... <laughs> Incremental, like I said, yeah, that's it. Yeah, but if you think about it, <laughs> if you think about it, that adds up really quickly. Yeah, I've heard you do your, you know, the dollar something about uh, savings. I had, you know, and that's, that's true. You think of it the same way. It's like stuff in the bank. You know, hopefully there's... And there's all those cliches. It's two steps forward, one step back. And basically, you go on. You keep trying to get better. You keep you trying to focus on what didn't work. Sometimes it's just today I'm probably just a bit tired and I uh, and it didn't quite go how I wanted it to go. Other yeah. people might be very happy with what I've done. You know, that's, that's the difficulty as well. So it's um, I know what I wanted to do. I think I did anyway. And it, I didn't quite achieve it. So. Yeah, yeah. Tomorrow. Exactly. And that I think that is probably without you knowing it, you've just given a really good example of, to me, what I see as the real difference between like a sort of optimistic versus pessimistic outlook in the sense that when you're trying to think how I can summarize this pretty quickly, but, you know, optimism versus pessimism, I think usually people assume that optimists only say good things, or they always 
are sort of Pollyanna-ish or they yeah. uh, bury their heads in the sand, et cetera, et cetera. But to mm. me, a more accurate description of, of a true optimist isn't that you never say anything that is negative. Negative. Yeah. yeah. Like you mentioned that that was sort of depressive or, or whatever. And, but I think what's most important is the thought that comes afterwards. So if you feel like I didn't do a great painting today, or I didn't get where I wanted to get today, and the the second the next thought is and so i'm such a crappy painter or i'm so ter- you know i'm this i'm that that's what i would consider to be a very pessimistic view and that i think is really shooting yourself in in the foot and does you no yeah, good sure. versus maybe i was tired today you know maybe i didn't have you know i didn't have a great day today that I think is a more optimistic view and a more helpful and healthy view than saying, you know, then immediately coming to this idea that you're not a great painter, or you never will be and blah, you know, like these ultimatum type statements yeah. versus, okay, tomorrow's like exactly what you said, tomorrow's another day, I can get mm-hmm. back in the studio yeah. tomorrow and keep moving forward. Yeah, I had a few years ago, I remember reading, and I didn't know who it was. It was a, a, a cartoonist, and he was saying that every morning, every day, even though he's been doing this for however long he'd been doing it, you know, he still didn't know how he did it. And so every day was full of angst about, you know, can he, can't he? And I thought, well, yeah, I, that's exactly how I feel. There's a certain, every time you go in the studio, you really don't know. Yeah, there are times when you're sort of rolling along and it's going well, and uh, it's almost like having to start afresh every day. Yeah. <laughs> All that learning. And- Which is good and bad, right? <laughs> it's yeah, on the yeah, one hand, yeah. it's like, yay, it's a new day. Like anything can happen and it's all fresh. And yeah. then, oh my God, it's another day. Or like, why can't? <laughs> yes. I've been doing this for so long. And why do I still feel like I don't know what I'm doing? <laughs> yes. A sort of one day long memory, you know, short term memory thing where everything's wiped clean every day and you groundhog day the whole day yeah yeah Yeah. exactly (laughs) (laughs) which is yeah which can be good and which can be bad but I think that's a really important conversation what you've brought up because we all go through this and sometimes it can feel like you're just spinning your wheels and so I think this idea of taking what you learn from one day into the next is critical to keep us as painters going on. And I think sometimes people don't recognize that. I think there is also a big thing about momentum. You know, one of the reasons that it's so, I can and have gone on for days and days, you know, I, I, you know, even in the last couple of months, I've done, you know, where I've done 45 days on the trot, 45 paintings and other paintings in between, you know, whilst uh, not just the day it is. And you you really get on a kind of, it become you become kind of invincible. There's a sort of uh, you know, I mean, again, there's there's days where it's less successful, but um, you really do take stuff with you every day back into the studio, and you feel like. Uh, and one of the most difficult things is stopping <laughs> and starting again. And so one of the reasons that I, when I do have a good run, and I I know that if I stop, it's actually. You stop one day, I miss one day, and I can miss two days, and I can miss three days, and then it becomes easier to miss days than just to start again. And so, you know, I'm just, I'm on day two now of uh, after a week off going to England and so on. And it's difficult to get back on. It's really, you know, to get back on the bicycle. It's There'll be a point when it starts to flow better, but it's almost, uh, well, almost doesn't dare stop <laughs> because it's so difficult to start again. Oh, that's so interesting. And I'm so glad that you brought that up because I was having a similar conversation with a student of mine who had been off painting for like a week or two and was feeling like he couldn't paint anymore because he'd been off for so long, you know, for two for two weeks. So I love another person saying, yeah, this is a thing, this this happens. And it, I think it also speaks to this idea that even if it's only 15 or 20 minutes, doing something every single day just makes your life so much 
easier in the long run. And again, it's that cumulative yeah. thing that we were talking about that as you continue to paint every day, even if it's just a little bit, that momentum that you build is, is super valuable. And, and it starts that flywheel going, it starts you going in the right direction. And that can also go in the opposite direction, which is, you know, that whole inertia versus momentum, right? That it can, it can be the opposite. I, I love the flywheel. Um, that's, that's, um, yeah, that's perfect. A great big heavy flywheel that once it's stopped is, you know, not easy to get going again. That's, that's perfect. Yeah. Keep that thing rolling around. I know. <laughs> Like you say, just touching base, you know, that's what it's like. You being in the studio doing something and just keeping it all it's also so much a mental thing, you know, your headspace. That's really for me. I'm living out here in the country, I've got a family and so on, but often I'm I can spend really a couple of weeks just solely in my own head, working through stuff and then going into the studio and working it. And uh, it doesn't make me very easy to live with, but that's just one of those things about it's kind of what you need. And um, that's real flywheel momentum, I guess. Yeah. It's kind of interesting what you said, that it doesn't make you very easy <laughs> to live with. I kind of, well, I didn't discover this. My husband pointed it out to me very clearly <laughs> that when I don't paint every day or when I'm not painting, I'm, I'm not fun to be around. <laughs> yeah, so yeah, it's really yeah. interesting that the most healthy thing, you know, like for our marriage is for me to paint every single day because my, as my husband says, I'm, I'm not. <laughs> yeah. No, I know. Well, it's, uh, yeah. The friend who I originally came down here to see, you know, 20 years ago, when it was, if I'd get low, he'd say, just ban, go and paint, you know. Yeah. He'd know full well that it was what things out for me. It doesn't always seem like it when you're not doing it. That's the trouble. But other people can tell you that that would be the thing to do. Go back in the studio. Immediately. Yeah. For God's sakes, please. <laughs> Here's your paintbrush. Go. <laughs> My wife's father's a painter, so um, and she uh, knew what she was getting into. Ah, uh, yes. That's my my excuse anyway. <laughs> my poor husband had no idea, but at least he's observant <laughs> enough and vocal enough about it to be like, you know what? <laughs> I think you should paint. <laughs> and and the funny thing is, is that I think oftentimes artists struggle with this sort of guilt for being an artist and the amount of time that it takes and going in and locking ourselves into our studio. And there's ex obviously there's extremes to everything. If you're the type of person that's completely ignoring your family and not spending any time with them and locking yourself away and not communicating, that's not what I'm talking about. But what I am talking about is that this, this idea that we sort of like, that's who we are as human beings is that is we are artists. And when we don't honor that, we tend to become intolerable human beings, you know? And so kind of like the, the best gift you can give to your family is to <laughs> take care of yourself, both physically and mentally. And then in the case of most artists, the mental self-care is getting your studio and paint. Yeah. I saw a documentary about uh, Alice Neal. Is it Alice mm -hmm. Neal? Neal. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And you know, made by uh, her grandson, I think. Yeah, that's good. You should see that if you get to get a chance to see it. It's extraordinary. Yes, and I'm, and from what I, I I haven't seen it, and I don't. I would not consider myself an authority on Alice Neal, but from what I, what I've picked up, she was in that other extreme of locking everybody out and just painting. Do I have that right? Uh, yeah, she had yes. two kids running around, and uh, but uh, yeah, yeah. But she, yeah, and they have opinions about it. Yes, we're both grown grown ups now, but obviously. Yes. But, uh, yeah, that's <laughs> yes, that's an extreme. She went to the other extreme of ignoring the family and damaging the people she loved. Yeah, yeah, which is not what. Yeah, that's yeah. <laughs> I'm trying not to do that. Yes. <laughs> yes. <laughs> well, Julian, speaking of family, I know you have people out waiting for you to have dinner and and all sorts of things and join the party, as it were. So thank mm. you very much for for this conversation and for taking the time to talk with me and for all of the insights that you gave us. <laughs> it's great. To be. I hope it was in some small way useful or interesting. It was great to talk and I'll see you in Italy. Yes. 
Thank you so much to Julian for such a great conversation. Go to SavvyPainter.com for show notes on this episode to connect with Julian and to see his paintings. While you're there, make sure you don't miss an episode of the podcast. Sign up for show updates and free guides at SavvyPainter.com forward slash subscribe. One more thing I want to let you know, this year you can expect a lot more workshops from Savvy Painter. If you are an artist who struggles with getting painting time in or feels like you're always busy but never really moving forward with your art, then my workshops just might interest you. Past workshops include Mindset Mastery, a five-week online workshop to help you get past the roadblocks that keep you from painting. In it, we tackle the inner critic, fears of artists, and setting yourself up for a successful creative day. The workshop, How to Develop a Relationship with the Right Gallery, helped several artists find the right gallery and show their work. So if this is something that interests you, you can go to SavvyPainter.com forward slash workshop and get on the email list. This is separate from the main list that tells you when a new episode comes out. This is just for the workshop. So you don't get quite as many emails, but when you do, there's always something really good happening. Sign up now and get a downloadable PDF with case studies that tell you exactly how three artists pushed through barriers that were getting in the way of their studio time. You can, for example, learn how Rhonda went from not wanting to call herself an artist to getting her very first solo show. Also, listen to an introverted artist describe how she built her confidence and then spoke in front of an audience of her peers. And you can discover the tools that Samantha used to take back her power after a decade of believing that she had no, I'm putting air quotes there, she had no talent. So again, go to SavvyPainter.com forward slash workshop to reserve your place on the list. When you sign up, you get that downloadable case studies that I mentioned, but more importantly, you get exclusive invites to upcoming workshops. Most of the time when I launch a new program, it sells out before I ever announce it publicly. So reserve your spot now at SavvyPainter.com forward slash workshop. Until next week, this is Antrice Wood with the Savvy Painter podcast. Thank you so much for listening. 